Okay, so last class of part one. Um, I guess the theme of part one is classification and regression with deep learning, uh, and specifically it's about identifying and learning the best practices for classification and regression. Um, and we started out with the kind of, here are three lines of code to do image classification. Um, and gradually we've been, well the first four lessons were then kind of going through NLP, structured data, collaborative filtering, and kind of understanding some of the key pieces, and most importantly understanding, you know, how to actually make these things work well in practice. And then the last three lessons are then kind of going back over all of those topics in kind of reverse order uh, to understand more detail about what was going on and understanding what the code looks like behind the scenes and learning to kind of write them from scratch. Um, part two of the course um, will move from a focus on classification and regression, which is kind of predicting a thing, like a number, or, or at most a small number of things, like a small number of labels. And we'll focus more on generative modeling. Generative modeling means predicting um, kind of lots of things. For example, creating a sentence, such as in neural translation, or image captioning, or question answering, or creating an image, uh, such as in um, style transfer, super resolution, segmentation, and so forth. Um, and then in part two, it'll move away from being just here are some best practices, you know, established best practices either through people that have written papers or through research that FastAI has done and kind of got convinced that these are best practices to some stuff which will be a little bit more speculative. You know, uh, some stuff which is maybe recent papers that haven't been fully tested yet um, and sometimes in part two like papers will come out in the middle of the course and we'll change direction with the course and study that paper because it's just, you know, interesting. And so if you're interested in kind of um, learning a bit more about how to read a paper um, and how to implement it from scratch and so forth, then that's another good reason to do part two. Um, it still doesn't assume any particular math background, but it does, as beyond kind of high school, but it, but it does assume that you're prepared to spend time like, you know, digging through the notation and, and understanding it and converting it to code and, and so forth. All right, so where we're up to is, is RNNs at the moment, and um, I think one of the issues I find most with teaching RNNs is trying to ensure that people understand they're not in any way different or unusual or magical, they're, they're just a standard, fully connected network. And so let's go back to the standard fully connected network, which looks like this, right? So to remind you, the arrows represent um, one or more layer operations, um, generally speaking a, a linear followed by a nonlinear function, uh, in this case they're matrix multiplications uh, followed by ReLU or, or THAN. Um, and the arrows of the same color represent the same, exactly the same weight matrix being used. Um, and so one thing which was just slightly different from previous fully connected networks we've seen is that we have an input coming in at the, not just at the first layer, but also at the second layer and also at the third layer. And we tried a couple of approaches. One was concatenating the inputs and one was adding the inputs. Okay, but there was nothing at all conceptually different about this. So that code um, looked like this. Uh, we had um, um, a model where we basically defined the, the three arrows colors we had as three different weight matrices, okay? Um, and by using the linear class, we got actually both the weight matrix and the bias vector wrapped up for free for us. Um, and then we went through and we did each of our embeddings, put it through our first linear layer, um, and then we did each of our we call them hiddens, being the, uh, I think they were orange, um, orange arrows. Um, and in order to avoid the fact that there's no orange arrow coming into the first one, we decided to kind of invent an empty matrix, and that way uh, every one of these rows looked the same. 
right? And so then we did exactly the same thing except we um, Used a loop just to refactor the code. Okay, so it's just a, it was just a code refactoring. There was no change of anything conceptually and since we were doing a refactoring uh, we took advantage of that to increase the number of characters to eight because I was too lazy to type eight linear layers But I'm quite happy to change the, the loop index to eight. Okay, so this now looped through uh, This exact same thing, but we had eight of these rather than three um, So then we refactored that again by taking advantage of nn.rnn Um, which basically puts that loop together for us uh, and keeps track of the um, this H uh, as it goes along for us um, And so by using that we were able to replace the loop um, With a single call and so again, that's just a refactoring uh, doing exactly the same thing Okay, so then we looked at something Which uh, was mainly designed to save some training time um, which was previously We had um, if we had a, a, a Big piece of text right so we've got like a movie review Right we were basically splitting it up into eight character segments and would grab like segment number one And use that to predict the next character, right? Um, but in order to make sure that we kind of used all of the data, we didn't just put it up like that. We actually said, like, okay, here's our whole thing. Let's grab the first will be to grab this section, the second will be to grab that section, then that section, then that section, and each time we'd be predict predicting the next one character along. Okay, and so. You know, I was a bit concerned that that seems pretty wasteful because like as we calculate This section nearly all of it overlaps with the previous section Okay, so instead um, what we did was we said all right. Well, what if we? actually did split it into non overlapping pieces Right and we said all right, let's grab this section here and use it to predict Every one of the characters one along Right and then let's grab this section here and use it to predict every one of the characters one along So after we look at the first character in we try to predict the second character and then after we look at the second character We try to predict the third character and so forth. Okay, and so that's where we've got to and then um, one of uh, you perceptive folks um, asked a really interesting question or, or expressed a concern which was Hey, after we got through the first the first point here After we got through the first point here We kind of we threw away our H Activations and started a new one which meant that when it was trying to use character one to predict character two It's got nothing to go on. You know, it hasn't built. It's only built. It's only done one Linear layer and so that seems like a problem which indeed it is Okay, so we're going to do the obvious thing Which is let's not throw away H Okay, so let's not throw away that um, That matrix at all so in code the big problem is Here right every time we call forward. So in other words every time we do a new mini batch. We're creating our, our hidden state Right, which remember is the orange circles, right? We're resetting it back to a bunch of zeros. And so as we go to the next non-overlapping section, we're saying forget everything that's come before. But in fact, the whole point is we know exactly where we are. We're at the end of the previous section and about to start the new next contiguous section. So let's not throw it away. So instead, the idea would be to cut this out, right? Move it up to Here, okay, store it away in self and then kind of keep updating it. Right now, so we're going to do that, um, and there's going to be some minor details to get right. So let's start by looking at the model. 
So here's the model. It's it's nearly identical, and um, okay. Here's the model. It's nearly identical, but I've got, as expected, one more line in my constructor where I call something called init hidden, and as expected, init hidden sets self dot h to be a bunch of zeros. Okay, so that's entirely unsurprising. And then, as you can see, our R and N now takes in self dot h, and it, as before, spits out our new hidden activations. And so now the trick is to now store that away um, inside self dot h. And so here's wrinkle number one. If you think about it, if I was to simply do it like like that. Right, and now I train this on a document that's I don't know a million words a million characters long Then the size of this unrolled RNN is has a million circles in and So that's fine going forwards, right? But then when I finally get to the end and I say here's my character and actually remember we're doing multi output now so multi output looks like this Right, or if we were to draw the unrolled version of multi output, we would have a triangle coming off at every point Okay So the problem is that then when we do back propagation we're calculating You know how much does the error at character one? Impact the final answer how much does the error at character two impact the final answer and so forth and so we need to go back through and say like How do we have to update our weights based on all of those, you know, um, errors? And so if there are a million characters, my unrolled RNN is a million layers long. I have a one million layer fully connected network, right? And like I never didn't have to write the million layers because I have the for loop and the for loops hidden away behind the, you know, the, the self dot RNN, but it's still there, right? We so. So this is actually a one million layer fully connected network and so the problem with that is it's going to be very memory intensive Because in order to do the chain rule I have to be able to multiply at every step like you know uh, F dash u times G uh, G dash X right and so like I've got that means I have to remember the, those values u, the value of every Set of layers so I'm going to have to remember all those million layers and I'm going to do have to have to do a million multiplications And I'm going to have to do that every batch. Okay, so that would be bad. Um, so to avoid that, we basically say, all right, well, from time to time, uh, I want you to forget your history, right? So we can still remember the state, right? Which is to remember like what's the actual values in our hidden matrix, right? But we can remember the state without remembering everything about how we got there. So there's a little function. Uh, called repackage variable Which literally is just this right it just simply says um, Grab the tensor out of it right because remember the tensor itself doesn't have any concept of history Right and create a new variable out of that and so this variable is going to have the same value but no no history of operations And therefore when it tries to back propagate it'll it'll stop there So basically what we're going to do then is we're going to call this in our forward So that means it's going to do eight characters. It's going to go back propagate through eight layers um, It's going to keep track of the actual values in our hidden state um, But it's going to throw away at the end of those eight um, It's its history of operations So this is uh, this approach Uh, it's called uh, back prop through time and uh, You know when you read about it online people make it sound like Like a different algorithm or some big insight or something, but it, it's it's not at all right It's just saying hey after our for loop, you know just Throw away your your history of operations and start afresh So we're keeping our hidden state, but we're not keeping our hidden states history Okay So that's um, that's wrinkle number one. That's what this repackage bar is doing. And so when you see 
BP, BPTT, that's referring to back crop through time, and you might remember we saw that in our um, original RNN lesson, uh, uh, we had a, a variable called BPTT equals 70, and so when we set that, we're actually saying how many layers to back prop through. Another good reason not to back prop through too many layers is if you have any kind of gradient instability, like gradient explosion or gradient spanishing, you know, too many more the more layers you have, the harder the network gets to train. So slower and less resilient. On the other hand, a longer value for BPTT means that you're able to explicitly capture uh, a longer kind of memory, more state. Okay, um, so that's a that's something that you get to tune um, when you create your RNN. Um, all right, wrinkle number two is how are we going to put the data into this? Right? Like it's all very well the way I described it just now, where we said you know, we could do this, and we can first of all look at this section, then this section, then this section. But we want to do a mini batch at a time. Right? We want to do a bunch at a time. <clears throat> so in other words, we want to say, let's do it like this. So mini batch number one would say, let's look at this section and predict that section. And at the same time, in parallel, let's look at this totally different section and predict this. And at the same time, in parallel, let's look at this totally different section and predict predict this, right? And so then, because remember in our um, in our hidden state, we have a, a vector of hidden state for everything in our mini batch, right? So it's going to keep track of at the end of this there's going to be a you know a vector here, a vector here, a vector here, and then we can move across to the next one and say, okay, for this part of the mini batch, use this to predict that, and use this to predict that, and use this to predict that. Right, so you can see that we're moving. We've got like a number of totally separate bits of our text that we're moving through in parallel, right? So hopefully this is going to ring a few bells for you because what happened was um, was uh, back when we started looking at torch text for the first time, we started talking about how it creates these mini batches, and I said what happened was we took our whole big long document consisting of like you know the entire works of Nietzsche or all of the IMDB reviews concatenated together or whatever and a lot of a lot of you not surprisingly because this is really this is really weird at first a lot of you didn't quite hear what I said correctly what I said was we split this into 64 equal size chunks and a lot of your brains went Jeremy just said we split this into chunks of size 64. But that's not what Jeremy said. Jeremy said we split it into 64 equal size chunks, right? So if this whole thing was length 64 million, right, which would be a reasonable sized corpus, okay, not an unusual sized corpus, then each of our 64 chunks would have been of length 1 million, right? And so then what we did was we took the first chunk of 1 million and we put it here. And then we took the second chunk of 1 million and we put it here. And the third chunk of 1 million, we put it here. And so forth to create 64 chunks. And then each mini batch consisted of us going, let's split this down here and here and here. And each of these is of size. B P T T, which I think we had something like 70, right? And so what happened was we said, all right, let's look at our first mini batch is all of these, right? So we do all of those at once and predict everything off set by one. And then at the end of that first mini batch, we went to the second chunk, right? And used each one of these to predict the next one off set by one. 
Okay, so that's that's why we did that slightly weird thing, right? Is that we wanted to have a bunch of things we can look through in parallel, uh, each of which, like, hopefully, are far enough away from each other, you know, that we don't have to worry about the fact that, you know, the truth is this starting, the start of this million characters was actually in the middle of a sentence, but you know, who cares, right? Because it's, you know, it only happens once every million characters. I was, wondering, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about augmentation for this kind of data set and how to uh, Data augmentation for this kind of data set? Yeah. No, I can't because I don't really know a good way um, It's one of the things I'm going to be studying between now and part two um, There have been some recent developments particularly something we talked about in the machine learning course, and I think we briefly mentioned here, which was um, somebody for a recent Kaggle competition won it by doing data augmentation by um, randomly inserting parts of, of different rows, basically. Uh, something like that may be useful here, and I've seen it. I've seen some papers that do something like that. Um, but yeah, I, I haven't seen any kind of recent-ish state of the art. Near, uh, NLP papers that that are doing this kind of data augmentation. So it's something we're planning to work on. Thanks. So Jeremy, how do you choose a BPTT? Um... Um, so there's a couple of things to think about when you pick your BPTT. The first is that you'll note that the the matrix size for a mini batch has a BPTT B P T T uh, by batch size. So one issue is your GPU RAM needs to be able to fit um, that by your embedding matrix, right? Because every one of these is going to have be of length embedding length um, plus all of the hidden state. So one thing is to you know if you get a CUDA out of memory error, you need to reduce one of those. Um, if you're finding <coughs> your training is very unstable, like your loss is shooting off to NAN suddenly, then you could try decreasing your BPTT because you've got less layers to gradient explode through. Um, if it's too slow, you could try decreasing your BPTT because it's got to kind of do one of those steps at a time. Like that for loop can't be parallelized. Um, well, I say that there's a, a, a recent thing called QRNN, which is we'll hopefully talk about in part two, which kind of does paralyze it. But the versions we're looking at don't, don't paralyze it. Um, so that would be the main issues, I think. Perfor look at performance, look at memory, and look at stability, and try and find a, a number that's you know as high as you can make it, but all of those things work for you. Uh, okay, so. Um, Trying to get all the, that um, chunking and lining up and everything to work is more code than I want to write. So for this section, we're going to go back and use torch text again. Okay. So um, when you're using APIs like FastAI and Torch Text, which in this case these two APIs are designed to, or at least from the FastAI side, designed to work together, you often have a choice, which is like, okay, this API. Has a number of methods that expect the data in this kind of format and you can either change your data to fit that format or you can write your own data set subclass to handle the format that your data is already in um, I've noticed on the forum a Lot of you are spending a lot of time writing your own data set classes Whereas I am way lazier than you and I spend my time instead changing my data to fit the data set classes I have Um, like either is fine um, And if you realize like oh, there's a kind of a format of data that Me and other people are likely to be seen quite often and it's not in the fast AI library Then by all means write the data set subclass submit it as a PR and then everybody can benefit you know um, But in this case, I just kind of thought um, I want to have some Nietzsche data fed into torch text um, I'm just going to put it in the format that torch text kind of already supports so torch text 
already has, or at least the fast AI wrapper around Torch Text already has something where you can have a training path and a validation path and you know one or more text files in each path containing a bunch of stuff that's concatenated together for your language model. So in this case, all I did was I made a copy of my Nietzsche uh, file, copied it into training, made another copy, stuck it into the validation, and then in one of them, you know, in the training uh, set, I, did, I deleted the last 20% of rows, and in the validation set, I deleted all except for the last 20% of rows, um, and I was done, right? So I found this that in this case, I found that easier than writing a custom dataset class. The other benefit of doing it that way was that I felt like it was more realistic to have a validation set that wasn't a random shuffled set of rows of text but was like a totally separate part of the corpus because I feel like in practice you're very often going to be saying like oh I've got I don't know these books or these authors I'm learning from and then I want to apply it to these different books and these different authors you know so I felt like for getting a, 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 a more realistic validation of my Nietzsche model I should use like a whole separate piece of the text so in this case it was the last you know 20% of the rows of the corpus um, so I haven't created this for you right in, intentionally um, because you know this is the kind of stuff I want you practicing is making sure that you're familiar enough comfortable enough with with bash or whatever that you can create these and that you understand what they need to look like and so forth um, so in this case um, you can see I've now got you know uh, a train and a validation here and then I could Inside here, okay. So you can see I've literally just got one file in it because as far when you're doing a language model, i.e., predicting the next character or predicting the next word, you don't really need separate files. It's fine if you do have separate files, but they just get concatenated together anyway. All right. So that's my source data, um, and so here is you know the same lines of code that we've seen before, and let's go over them again because it's a couple of lessons ago, right? So in Torch Text. We create this thing called a field and a field initially is just a description of how to go about Pre-processing the text. Okay now you uh, in this case. I'm gonna I say hey lowercase it You know because I don't I mean Now I think about it. There's no particular reason to have done this lowercase uppercase would work fine, too um, And then how do I tokenize it and so you might remember last time we used a tokenization function which kind of Largely split on white space and try to do some clever things with punctuation, right? And that gave us a word model In this case, I want a character model. So I actually want every character put into a separate token So I can just use the function list in Python because list in Python Does that Okay, so this is where you can kind of see like Understanding how libraries like torch text and fast AI are designed to be extended can make your life <clears throat> a lot easier, right? So when you realize that Very often both of these libraries kind of expect you to pass a Function that does something and then you realize like oh I can write any function. I like right Okay, so this is now going to mean that each mini batch is going to contain a list of characters And so here's where we get to define all our different um, parameters. And so to make it the same as previous uh, sections of this notebook, I'm going to use the same batch size, uh, the same number of characters, but I'm now going to rename it to BPTT since we know what that means. Um, the number of the size of the embedding um, and the size of our hidden state. Okay, remembering that size of our hidden state simply means. Going all the way back to the start right? And hidden simply means the size of the the state that's created by each of those orange arrows So it's the size of each of those circles Here okay So having done that we can then create a little dictionary saying what's our training validation and test set in this case I don't have a separate test set. So I just use the same thing um, And then I can say all right. I want a language model data subclass of model data. I'm going to grab it from text files and This is my path 
and this is my field, which I defined earlier, and these are my files, and these are my hyperparameters. Um, Minfrax not going to do anything actually in this case because there's not I don't think there's going to be any character that appears less than three times um, so That's probably redundant Okay, so at the end of that it says there's going to be 963 Batches to go through and so if you think about it that should be equal to the number of tokens divided by the batch size divided by BPTT because that's like the size of each of those rectangles um, You'll find that in practice it's not exactly that and the reason it's not exactly that is that the authors of uh, torch text um, Did something pretty smart, which I think we've briefly mentioned this before they said okay We can't shuffle the data like with images we like to shuffle the order so every time we see them in a different order So there's a bit more randomness. We can't shuffle because we need to be contiguous Um, but what we could do is randomize the length of you know basically randomize BPTT a little bit each time and so that's what PyTorch does it's not always going to give us exactly eight characters long five um, percent of the time it'll actually cut it in half uh, and then it's going to add on a small little standard deviation you know to make it slightly bigger or smaller than four or eight okay so it's going to be slightly different. Um, to eight on average uh, Yes Just to make sure um, is it gonna be um, Constant per mini batch. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's right. So a mini batch you know has to kind of It needs to do a matrix multiplication um, And the mini batch size has to remain constant Because we've got this H weight matrix that has to you know has to line up in size with the size of the mini batch Yeah, but the number you know the sequence length Can can change no problem Okay, so that's why we have 963 that's so the length of a data loader is how many mini batches In this case, it's a little bit approximate. Okay, number of tokens is how many unique things are in the vocabulary. And remember, after we run this line, text now does not just contain a description of what we want, but it also contains an extra attribute called vocab, right? Which contains stuff like a list of all of the unique. Um, uh, items in the vocabulary and a reverse mapping from each item to its number Okay, so that text object is now an important thing to keep track of All right um, So let's now try this so we now we, we started out by looking at the class Uh, so the class is exactly the same as the class we've had before um, The only key difference is to call init hidden which calls sets out so h is not a variable anymore It's now an attribute self dot h is a variable containing a bunch of zeros um, Now I mentioned that Batch size remains constant each time um, But unfortunately when I said that I lied to you um, And the way that I lied to you Is that the very last mini batch will be shorter? Okay, the very last mini batch is actually going to have less than 64. Well, it might be exactly the right size if it so happens that this data set is exactly divisible by BPTT times batch size, but it probably isn't. So the last batch will probably has a, a little bit less. Okay, and so that's why I do a little check here that says let's check that the batch size inside self dot h. Right, and so self dot h is going to be uh, the height um, um, Sorry the height is going to be the um, Number of activations and the width is going to be the mini batch size. Okay check that that's equal to The actual sequence length uh, Sorry the actual batch size length that we've received Okay, and if they're not the same 
then set it back to zeros again Okay, so this is just a minor little wrinkle that basically at the end of each epoch It's going to do like a little mini mini batch right and so then as soon as it starts the next epoch It's going to see that they're not the same again, and it'll reinitialize it to the correct full batch size Okay, so that's why you know if you're wondering there's an init hidden not just in the constructor But also inside forward it's to handle this kind of end of each epoch start of each epoch Difference okay not an important point by any means, but potentially confusing when you see it Okay um, So the last wrinkle the last wrinkle is something which I think is something that slightly sucks about PyTorch and maybe somebody can be nice enough to try and fix it with a PR if anybody feels like it which is that the loss functions such as softmax um, Are not happy receiving a rank 3 tensor Remember a rank 3 tensor is just another way of saying a dimension 3 array Okay um, There's no particular reason they ought to not be happy receiving a rank 3 tensor yeah. You know like somebody could write some code to say hey a rank 3 tensor is probably you know a sequence length by batch size by you know results uh, thing and so you should just do it for each of the two um, uh, Initial axes, um, but no one's done that um, And so it expects it to be a rank 2 tensor uh, Funnily enough it can handle rank 2 or rank 4 but not rank 3 right. So we've got um, Oopsie daisy So we've got a rank 2 tensor um, containing, you know, for each time period I can't remember which way around the, the axes are, but whatever, for each time period For each batch We've got our predictions Okay, and then we've got our our actuals for each time period For each batch All right, we've got our predictions and we've got our actuals Okay, and so we just want to check whether they're the same and so in an ideal world our lost function a loss function would check You know item 1 1 then item 1 2 and then item 1 3 But since that hasn't been written we just have to flatten them both out Okay, and we can literally just flatten them out put rows to rows um, and so that's why here I have to use dot view Okay And so dot view um, Says the number of columns will be equal to the size of the vocab because remember we're going to end up with a prediction You know a probability for each letter and then the number of rows is However big is necessary, which will be equal to batch size times BPTT Okay um, And then um, You may be wondering where I do that for that's so that's for the predictions You may be wondering where I do that for the target and the answer is torch text knows that the target needs to look like that So torch text has already done that for us. Okay, so torch text automatically changes the target to be flattened out um, And you might actually remember if you go back to lesson four uh, when we actually looked at a mini batch that spat out of torch text We did we noticed actually that it was flattened and I said we'll learn about why later And so later is now arrived uh, Okay, so they're the three wrinkles um, get rid of the history um, um, Well, I guess four wrinkles um, Recreate the um, hidden state if the batch size changes um, flatten out uh, And then use torch text to create mini batches that line up nicely uh, so Once we do those things we can then uh, create our model uh, create our optimizer with that model's parameters and fit it um, One thing to be careful of here is that um, Softmax now uh, as of PyTorch 0.3 uh, requires that we pass in 
a number here saying which axis do we want to do the softmax over? So at this point this is a three-dimensional tensor Right, and so we want to do the softmax over the final axis, right? So when I say which axis do we do the softmax over remember we divide by so we go e to the xi divided by the sum of e to the xi so it's saying which axis do we sum over so which axis do we want to sum to one and so in this case clearly we want to do it over the last axis because the last axis is the one that contains the probability per letter of the alphabet and we want all of those probabilities to sum to one okay um, so therefore uh, to run this notebook you're going to need PyTorch 0.3, which just came out this week. Okay, so if you're doing this on the MOOC, you're fine. I'm sure you've got at least 0.3 or later. Okay, um, whereas the students here, if you just go conda env update, it'll automatically update you to 0.3. Um, the really great news is that uh, 0.3, although it does not yet officially support Windows, um, it does in practice. Uh, I successfully installed 0.3 from Conda yesterday by typing Conda install torch, uh, PyTorch in Windows. Uh, I then attempted to use the entirety of lesson one and every single part worked. Uh, so I actually ran it on this very laptop. Um, so for those who are interested in doing deep learning on their laptop, can definitely recommend the new Surface Book. Um, the new Surface Book 15-inch has a GTX 1060 6 gig GPU in it, and I was getting it. Uh, it was running about um, three times slower than my um, uh, 1080 Ti, which I think means it's about the same speed as an AWS P2 instance. Uh, and as you can see, it's also a nice convertible tablet that you can write on, and it's thin and light and so it's like I've never seen a such a good deep learning box uh, also uh, I successfully installed Linux on it and all of the fast AI stuff worked on the Linux as well so really good option if you're interested in a laptop that can run deep learning stuff um, all right so that's uh, that's going to be aware of with this dm equals minus one um, so then we can go ahead and construct this and we can call fit and Yeah, we're basically going to get pretty s similar results to um, What we got before All right, so then um, We can go a bit further with our RNN by just kind of unpacking it a bit more and So this is now again exactly the same thing gives exactly the same answers, but I have removed the um, the call to RNN. So I've got rid of this self dot RNN. Okay, um, and so this is just something I won't spend time on it, but you can check it out. So instead, I've now defined RNN as RNN cell, and I've copied and pasted the code above. Don't run it. This is just for your reference from PyTorch. This is this is the uh, the definition of RNN cell in PyTorch, and I want you to see that you can now read. PyTorch source code and understand it. Not only that, you'll recognize it as being something we've done before. It's a matrix multiplication of the weights by the inputs plus biases. So f dot linear simply does a matrix product followed by an addition. Right? And interestingly, you'll see they do not concatenate the um, the input bit and the hidden bit. They sum them together. Which is uh, our first approach and I'm, I, as I said you can do either neither one's right or wrong But it's interesting to see this is the definition here. Yes, you know um, Can you give us some insight about uh, what are they using that particular uh, activation function then yeah, yeah um, I Think we might have briefly covered this last week, but very happy to do it again if I did um, basically then that's positive one and negative one. Than looks like that. So in other words, it's a sigmoid function, double the height minus one. Literally, they're they're equal. Um, so it's 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 a nice function in that it's forcing it to be 
you know, no smaller than minus one, no bigger than plus one. And since we're multiplying by this weight matrix again and again and again and again, um, we might worry that a ReLU, because it's unbounded, um, might have more of a gradient explosion problem. Um, that's basically the theory. Uh, having said that, um, you can actually um, ask PyTorch for an RNN cell which uses a different nonlinearity. So you can see by default it uses than, but you can ask for a ReLU as well. Um, but yeah, most people seem to, pretty much everybody still seems to use than, as far as I can tell. Um, so you can basically see here, this is all the same, except now I've got an RNN cell, which means now I need to put my for loop back, right? And you can see every time I call my my little linear function, I just append the result onto my list. Okay, and at the end, the result is that all stacked up together. Okay, so like just trying to show you how nothing inside PyTorch is is mysterious, right? And you should find you get basically the. In fact, you, I found I got exactly the same answer from this as the previous one. Okay. Um, in practice, you would never write it like this, but what you may well find in practice is that somebody will come up with like a new kind of RNN cell or a different way of kind of keeping track of things over time or a different way of doing regularization. And so I, uh, inside um, FastAI's code, you will find that we we do this exactly this basically we have this by hand because we use some regularization approaches that aren't supported by PyTorch. All right, so then another thing I'm not going to spend much time on, but I'll mention briefly, is that um, nobody really uses this RNN cell in practice. And the reason we don't use that RNN cell in practice is even though the than is here, um, you do tend to find um, gradient explosions are still a problem, and so we have to use pretty low learning rates to get these to train, and pretty small values for BPTT to get them to train. Um, so what we do instead is we replace the RNN cell with something like this. This is called a GRU cell. Um, and a GRU cell uh, Here it is. It has a picture of it, and there's the equations for it. So basically, um, I'll show you both quickly, but we'll talk about it much more in part two. Um, we've got our input, okay, uh, and our input normally goes straight in, uh, gets multiplied by um, a weight matrix to create our new activations. Um, that's not what happens, uh, and then we, of course we also we add it to the existing activations. That's not what happens here. In this case, our input goes into this H tilde temporary thing, and it doesn't just get added to our activations, our previous activations, but our previous activations get multiplied by this value R, and R stands for reset. Uh, it's a reset gate, right? And how do we calculate the, this, this value? It goes between 0 and 1, right, in our reset gate. Well, the answer is it's simply equal to a matrix product between some weight matrix and the concatenation of our previous hidden state and our new input. In other words, this is a little one hidden layer neural net. And in particular, it's a one hidden layer neural net because we then put it through the sigmoid function. When you see sig one of the things I hate about mathematical notation is symbols are overloaded a lot, right? Sometimes when you see sigma, it means standard deviation. When you see it next to a parenthesis like this, it means the sigmoid function. Okay, so in other words, that, okay, which looks like that, okay? Um, so this is like a little mini neural net with no hidden layers, or to think of it another way, it's like a little logistic regression. Okay, and this is, I, I mentioned this briefly because it's going to come up a lot in part two, and so it's a good thing to like start learning about. It's this idea that like in the very learning itself, you can have like little mini neural nets inside your neural nets, right? And so this little mini neural net is going to be used to decide how much 
of my hidden state am I going to remember? Right? And so it might learn that, oh, in this particular situation, forget everything you know. For example, oh, there's a full stop. You know, hey, when you see a full stop, you should throw away nearly all of your hidden state. That is probably something it would learn, and that's very easy for it to learn using this little mini neural net. Right? And so that goes through to create my new hidden state along with the input. And then there's a second thing that happens, which is there's this gate here called Z. And what Z says is, all right, you've got your some amount of your previous hidden state plus your new input, right? And it's going to go through to create your new state. And I'm going to let you decide to what degree do you use this new input uh, version of your hidden state, and to what degree will you just leave the hidden state the same as before? So this thing here is called the update gate, right? And so it's got two choices it can make. The first is to throw away some hidden state when deciding how much to incorporate that versus my new input, and how much to update my hidden state versus just leave it exactly the same. And the equation, hopefully, um, is going to look pretty similar, to, familiar to you, which is check this out here. Remember how I said you want to start to recognize some some co common ways of looking at things? Well, here I have a one minus something by a thing, and a something without the one minus by a thing, which remember is a linear interpolation, right? So in other words, the value of Z is going to decide to what degree do I have keep the previous hidden state and to what degree do I use the new hidden state, right? So that's why they draw it here as this kind of like it's not actually a switch But like you can put it in any position you can be like oh, it's here or it's here or it's here to decide how much to update Okay, so um, So they're basically the equations. It's a, t it's a little mini neural net with its own weight matrix to decide how much to update. Little mini neural net with its own weight matrix to decide how much to reset. And then that's used to do an interpolation between the two hidden states. So that's called a, um, a GRU, Gated Recurrent Network. Uh, there's the definition from the PyTorch source code. Um, they uh, have some slight optimizations here that if you're interested in, we can talk about them on the on the um, forum, but it's exactly the same formula we just saw. Um, and so if you go nn.gru, then it uses this same code, but it replaces the R and N cell with this cell. Okay, and um, as a result, rather than having something where we needed, uh, where we were getting a 1.54, Um, we're now getting down to 1.40 and we can keep training even more get right down to 1.36 Okay, so in practice a GRU or very nearly equivalently. We'll see in a moment an LSTM um, uh, In practice what pretty much everybody always uses So the uh, RT and HT are ultimately scalars after they go through the Sigmoid, but they're applied element wise. Is that correct? to mm -hmm. both yeah. the H's. Okay. Yeah, although of course one for each mini batch. But yeah, it's a scalar per Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. Um and um on the excellent Kolar's blog, Chris Olar's blog, there's an understanding LSTM networks uh post which uh you can read all about this in much more detail if you're interested. And also the other one I was Dealing from here is uh, wild ml I also have a good blog post on this If somebody wants to be helpful feel free to put them in the lesson wiki if you can find them um, Okay, so then putting it all together um, I'm now going to replace my GRU with an LSTM. I'm not going to bother showing you the cell for this It's very similar to GRU, um, but the LSTM has one more a uh, piece of state in it called the cell state not just the hidden state So if you do use an LSTM you now inside your init hidden have to return a tuple of Matrices they're exactly the same size as the hidden state, um, but you just have to return a tuple Okay, uh, the details don't matter too much, but um, we can talk about it during the week if you're interested um, 
um, you know when you pass in you still pass in self dot h still returns a new value of h You still can repackage it in the usual way. So this code is identical to the code before um, One thing I've done though is I've added dropout um, uh, Inside my RNN which you can do with the PyTorch RNN function so that's going to do dropout after each time step uh, And I've doubled the size of my hidden layer since I've now added 0.5 dropout and so my hope was that this would make it Be able to learn more, but be um, more resilient as it does so. Um, so then I wanted to show you how to um, take advantage of a little bit more uh, fast AI magic without using the layer class. And so I'm going to show you how to use uh, callbacks, um, uh, and specifically we're going to do um, um, SGDR. Um, without without using the learner class. Okay, so to do that we create our model again just a standard PyTorch model Okay, and this time rather than going remember the usual uh, PyTorch approach is Opt equals optim dot atom and you pass in the parameters and the learning rate. Okay, I'm not going to do that I'm going to use the fast AI layer optimizer class which takes my optim uh, class constructor From PyTorch, it takes my model, it takes my learning rate, and optionally takes weight decay. Okay, and so this class is tiny; it doesn't do very much at all. Uh, the key reason it exists is to do differential learning rates and differential weight decay, right? But the reason we need to use it is that uh, all of the mechanics inside FastAI assumes that you have one of these, right? So if you want to use like callbacks or SGDR or whatever um, In code where you're not using the learner class um, Then you need to use rather than saying, you know, uh, opt equals optim dot atom and here's my parameters you instead say uh, layer optimizer, okay? Um, so that gives us um, a layer optimizer object and if you're interested basically behind the scenes uh, you can now grab a dot opt um, Property which actually gives you the optimizer, right? You don't have to worry about that yourself But that's basically what happens behind the scenes the key thing we can now do is that we can now when we call fit we can pass in that optimizer And we can also pass in some callbacks and specifically we're going to use The cosine annealing callback Okay, and so the cosine annealing callback requires a layer optimizer object Right and so what this is going to do is it's going to do cosine annealing by changing the learning rate inside this object Okay So the details aren't terribly important. We can talk about them on the forum. It's really the concept I wanted to get across here, right? Which is that now that we've done this we can say all right Create a cosine annealing callback Which is going to update the learning rates in this layer optimizer um, The length of an epoch is equal to this here, right? How many mini batches are there in an epoch? Well, it's whatever the length of this data loader is Okay, so because it's going to be it's going to be doing the cosine annealing it needs to know how often to reset Okay um, And then you can pass in the cycle malt in the usual way and then We can even save our model automatically like remember how there was that uh, Cycle save name parameter that we can pass to learn dot fit. This is what it does behind the scenes behind the scenes It sets an on cycle end callback And so here I have to find that callback as being something that saves my model Okay, so there's quite a lot of cool stuff that you can do with callbacks uh, Callbacks are basically things where you can define like at the start of training or at the start of an epoch or at the start of a batch Or at the end of training or at the end of an epoch or at the end of a batch, please call this code Okay, and so we've written some for you including uh, SGDR which is the cosine annealing uh, callback Um, and then Sahar recently wrote a new callback to implement the new approach to decoupled weight decay um, We use callbacks to draw those little graphs of, of the loss over time um, So there's lots of cool stuff you can do with callbacks. So in this case By passing in that callback we're getting um, SGDR and that's able to get us down to um, 
uh, here, and then we can train a little bit more and eventually get down to 1.25. And so we can now test that out. Um, and so if we pass in a few characters of text, uh, we get, not surprisingly, an E after four of those. Um, let's do then 400, and now we have our own Nietzsche. So Nietzsche tends to start his sections with a number and a dot, so 293, perhaps that every life of values of blood, of intercourse, when it senses there is unscrupulous, his very rights and still impulse love. Okay, so I mean, it's slightly less clear than Nietzsche normally, but it gets the tone right. Okay. Um, and it's actually quite interesting, like, if to play around with training these character-based language models, to, to like run this at different levels of loss, to get a sense of like, what does it look like? Like, you really notice that this is like 1.25, and like, at slightly worse, at like 1.3, this looks like total junk, you know, there's like punctuation in random places and you know Nothing makes sense and like you start to realize that the difference between You know Nietzsche and random junk is not that far in kind of language model terms And so if you train this for a little bit longer, you'll suddenly find like oh, it's 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 making more and more sense right so if you are playing around with NLP stuff um, particularly generative stuff like this and you're like the results are like kind of okay, but not great. Don't be disheartened because that means you're actually very, very nearly there. You know, the, the difference between like something which is starting to create something which almost vaguely looks English if you squint, and something that's actually a very good generation. It's it's not it's not far in loss function terms. Okay, great. So let's take a five minute break. We'll come back at seven forty five, and we're going to go back to computer vision. Okay, so now we come full circle back to vision. So now we're looking at Lesson 7, Sci-Fi 10 notebook. You might have heard of Sci-Fi 10. Um, it's a really well-known data set in academia. Um, and it's partly it's well-known because it's, it's actually pretty old by you know, computer vision standards. Um, well before ImageNet was around, there was Sci-Fi 10. You might wonder why we're going to be looking at such an old data set. And actually, I think small data sets are much more interesting um, than ImageNet because, like, most of the time, you're likely to be working with stuff with a small number of thousands of images rather than one and a half million images. Some of you will work with one and a half million images, but most of you won't. Right? So learning how to use these kind of data sets I think is much more interesting often also a lot of the stuff We're looking at like in medical imaging. We're looking at like the specific area where there's a lung nodule You're probably looking at like 32 by 32 pixels At most as being the area where that lung nodule actually exists Right and so sci-fi 10 is small both in terms of it doesn't have many images and the images are very small And so therefore I think this is like it's in a lot of ways. It's much more challenging um, than something like ImageNet, and in some ways it's much more interesting, right? Um, and also, most importantly, you can run stuff much more quickly on it, so it's much better to test out your algorithms with something you can run quickly, um, and it's still challenging. Right? And so I, I hear a lot of researchers complain about like how they can't afford to study all the different versions of their algorithm properly because it's too expensive, and they're doing it on ImageNet. So like it's literally a week of you know expensive CP GPU work for every study they do and like I don't understand why you would do that kind of study on ImageNet. It doesn't make sense Okay, and so um, This has been a particularly uh, You know there's been a particular lot of kind of debate about this this week because um, really interesting researcher named Ali Rahami at NIPS this week gave a, a talk a really great talk about kind of the need for rigor in experiments in deep learning and you know he felt like there's a lack of rigor and I've talked to him about it quite a bit since that time and um, I'm not sure we yet quite understand each other as to where we're coming from but but we have very similar kinds of concerns which is basically people aren't doing 
carefully tuned, carefully thought about experiments, but instead they kind of throw lots of GPUs or lots of data and consider that a day. And so this idea of like saying like, well, you know, is my data set meant to, is my algorithm meant to be good at small images, at small data sets? Well, if so, let's study it on SciFar 10 rather than studying it on ImageNet and then do more studies of different versions of the algorithm, turning different bits on and off, understand which parts are actually important, and so forth. Um, people also complain a lot about MNIST, which we've looked about. Uh, looked at before and I would say the same thing about MNIST, right? Which is like if you're actually trying to understand which parts of your algorithm make a difference and why Using MNIST for that kind of study is a very good idea and all these people who complain about MNIST I, I think they're just showing off. They're saying like oh I work at Google and I have you know a pot of TPUs And I have a hundred thousand dollars a week of time to spend on it. And no worries um, But I don't you know. I think that's all it is you know, it's just signaling rather than actually academically rigorous Okay, so um, SciFar 10 you can download from here. Um, this person has very kindly made it available in um, image form um, If you Google for SciFar 10 you'll find us a, a much less convenient form. So please use this one um, It's already in the exact form you need once you download it um, You can use it in the usual way um, uh, So here's a list of the Classes that are there um, Now you'll see here. I've created this thing called stats um, Normally when we've been using pre-trained models uh, we have been saying um, Transforms from model and that's actually Created the necessary transforms to convert our data set into a normalized data set based on the means and standard deviations of each channel in the original model that was trained in our case though this time we've got to train a model from scratch, so we have no such thing So we actually need to tell it the mean and standard deviation of our data to normalize it Okay, and so in this case I haven't included the, the code here to do it You should try and try this yourself to confirm that you can do this and understand where it comes from But this is just the mean per channel and the standard deviation per channel of all of the images All right so um, we're going to try and create a model uh, from scratch um, And so the first thing we need is uh, some transformations. So for SciFar 10 people generally do uh, data augmentation of simply flipping randomly horizontally so here's how we can create a specific list of augmentations to use uh, and then they also tend to add a little bit of padding black padding around the edge and then randomly pick a 32 by 32 spot from within that padded image So if you add the pad parameter to any of the fast AI transform creators, it'll it'll do that for you, okay? And so in this case, I'm just gonna um, add four pixels around each size uh, and so now that I've got my transforms I can go ahead and create my uh, image classifier data dot from paths in the usual way Okay, um, I'm going to use a batch size of 256 because these are pretty small So it's going to let me do a little bit more at a time So here's what the data looks like So for example, here's a boat and just to show you how tough this is What's that? It is. It's a it's those not chicken frog, frog. So I guess it's this big thing, whatever the thing is called. There's your frog. Okay. So, so these are the kinds of things that we want to look at. So I'm going to start out. Um, so uh, our student Karim, we saw one of his posts earlier in this course. Uh, he he made this really cool uh, notebook, um, which uh, shows how different optimizers work. Um, ah, there we go. So Karen made this really cool um, notebook I think it was maybe last week in which he showed uh, how to create various different optimizers from scratch So this is kind of like the Excel thing I had but this is the Python version of momentum and Adam and Nesterov and Adagrad all written from scratch Which is very cool. Uh, one of the nice things he did was he showed a uh, tiny little um, general purpose fully connected network generator so we're going to start with his so so he called that simple net so are we um, so here's a simple class Which has a list 
of fully connected layers. Okay? Um, whenever you create a list of layers in PyTorch, you have to wrap it in nn.module list just to tell PyTorch to like register these as attributes. Um, and so then we just go ahead and flatten the data that comes in because it's fully connected layers and then go through each layer and call that linear um, uh, layer, uh, do the ReLU to it, and at the end do a softmax. Okay, so there's a really simple approach, and so we can now um, take that model, and now I'm going to show you how to step up one level of the API higher. Rather than calling the fit function, we're going to create a learn object, but we're going to create a learn object from a custom model. And so we can do that by saying we want a convolutional learner, we want to create it from a model and from some data, and the model is this one. So this is just a general PyTorch model, and this is a model data object of the usual kind. And that will return a learner. So this is a bit easier than what we just saw with the RNN. We don't have to fiddle around with layer optimizers and cosine annealing callbacks and whatever. This is now a learner that we can do all the usual stuff with, um, but we can do it with any model that we create. Okay? Um, so if we just go learn, that'll go ahead and print it out. Okay, so you can see we've got 3072 features coming in because we've got 32 by 32 pixels by three channels. Okay, and then we've got 40 features coming out of the first layer. That's going to go into the second layer, 10 features coming out because we've got the 10 sci-fi 10 categories. Okay? Um, you can call dot summary to see that in a little bit more detail. We can do LR find, we can plot that, uh, and we can then go fit, and we can use cycle length, and so forth. Okay, so with a simple, um, how many hidden layers do we have? One hidden layer, right? One hidden layer, one output layer, one hidden layer model. Um, with, and here we can see the number of parameters we have is that over 120,000. Okay, we get a 47% accuracy. Okay. So not great. Right, so let's kind of try and improve it, right? And so the goal here is we're going to try and eventually replicate the basic kind of architecture of a ResNet. Okay, so that's where we're going to try and get to here is gradually build up to a ResNet. So the first step is to replace our fully connected model with a convolutional model. Okay, so to remind you, So to remind you, a fully connected layer is simply doing a dot product, right? So if we had like all of these data points and all of these weights, right, then we basically do a sum product of all of those together, right? In other words, it's a matrix multiply, right? Then that's a fully connected layer, okay? And so we need a uh, the weight matrix is going to take, contain uh, an item for every every element of the input for every element of the output, right? So that's why we have here a pretty big weight matrix, right? And so that's why we had, despite the fact that we have such a crappy accuracy, we have a lot of parameters, because in this very first layer, we've got 3072 coming in and 40 coming out, so that gives us 3,000 times 40 parameters. And so we, we end up not using them very efficiently because we're basically saying every single pixel in the input has a different weight. And of course what we really want to do is kind of find groups of 3 by 3 pixels that have particular patterns to them. Okay? And remember we call that a convolution. Okay? So a convolution looks like so. We have like a little 3x3 three three section of our image, and a, a corresponding 3x3 three three set of filters, right? or a filter with a 3x3 three three kernel, and we just do a sum product of just that 3x3 three by, three by that 3x3. Three three. Okay? And then we do that for every single part of our image. Right? And so when we do that across the whole image, that's called a convolution. Right? And remember, in this case, we actually had multiple filters, 
right? So the result of that convolution actually had multiple, it was a tensor with an additional third dimension to it, effectively. Um, so let's take exactly the same code that we had before, but we're going to replace nn.linear with nn.com2d. Okay? Now what I want to do in this case though is each time I have a layer, I want to make the next layer smaller. And so the way I did that in my Excel example was I used um, max pooling, right? So max pooling took every 2x2 two two section and replaced it with its maximum value, right? Um, nowadays, we don't use that kind of max pooling much at all. Um, instead, nowadays what we tend to do is do what's called a stride 2 convolution. A stride 2 convolution, rather than saying let's go through every single 3x3, three three, it says let's go through every second 3x3. Three three. So rather than moving this 3x3 three three one to the right, we move it two to the right. And then when we get to the end of the row, rather than moving one row down, we move two rows down. Okay, so that's called a stride 2 convolution. And so a stride 2 convolution has the same kind of effect as a max pooling, which is you end up halving the resolution in each dimension. So we can ask for that by saying stride equals 2. Okay? Uh, we can say we want it to be 3 by 3 by saying kernel size. And then the first two parameters are exactly the same as nn.linear. They're the number of features coming in and the number of features coming out. Okay, so we create a module list of those layers. And then at the very end of that, um, so in this case I'm going to say, okay, I've got three channels coming in. The first one layer will come out with 20, then 40, and then 80. So if we look at the summary, we're going to start with a 32 by 32. We're going to spit out a 15 by 15, and then a 7 by 7, and then a 3 by 3. Right? And so what do we do now to get that down to a prediction of one of 10 classes? What we do is we do something called adaptive max pooling. And this is what is pretty standard now for state-of-the-art algorithms, is that the very last layer we do a max pool. Um, but rather than doing like a 2x2 two two max pool, we say, like it doesn't have to be 2x2, two two. it could have been 3x3, three three, which is like replace every 3x3 three three pixels with its maximum, it could have been 4x4. Four four. Adaptive max pool is where you say, I'm not going to tell you how big an area to pull, but instead I'm going to tell you how big a resolution to create. Right? So if I said, for example, um, I think my input here is like 28 by 28, right? If I said do a 14 by 14 adaptive max pool, that would be the same as a 2 by 2 max pool, because in other words it's saying please create a 14 by 14 output. If I said do a 2 by 2 adaptive max pool, right, then that would be the same as saying do a 14 by 14 max pool. And so what we pretty much always do in modern CNNs is we make our penultimate layer a one by one adaptive max pool. So in other words, find the single largest cell and use that as our new activation. Right? And so once we've got that, we've now got a, a one by one tensor, right? Or actually one by one by number of features tensor. So we can then, um, on top of that, go view, x dot view, x dot size, comma minus one, and actually there are no other dimensions to this, basically, right? So this is going to return a matrix of mini batch by number of features, um, and so then we can feed that into a linear layer with however many classes we need. Right? So you can see here, the last thing I pass in is how many classes am I trying to predict, and that's what's going to be used to create that last layer. So it goes through every convolutional layer, does a convolution, does a ReLU, does an adaptive max pool. Uh, this dot view just gets rid of those trailing unit axes, the 1,1 axis, which is not necessary. 
That allows us to feed that into our final linear layer that spits out something of size C, which here is 10. So you can now see how it works. It goes 32 to 15 to 7 by 7 to 3 by 3. The adaptive flex pool makes it 80 by 1 by 1, right? And then our dot view makes it just mini batch size by 80. And then finally a linear layer, which takes it from 80 to 10, which is what we wanted. Okay, so that's our like our most basic, you'd call this a fully convolutional network. So a fully convolutional network is something where every layer is convolutional um, except for the very last. Um, so again, we can now um, go LR.find, and now in this case when I did LR.find, um, it went through the entire data set and was still getting better. Uh, and so in other words, even a uh, the default final learning rate it tries is 10, and even at that point it was still like pretty much getting better. So you can always override the final learning rate by saying end LR equals that, and that'll get it just get it to try more things. Okay, and so here is the learning rate finder, um, and so I picked 10 to the minus 1, uh, trained that for a while, and that's looking pretty good. So then I tried it with a cycle length of 1, and it's starting to flatten out at about 60%. Right? So you can see here the number of elements, uh, the number of parameters I have here are 500, 7,000, 28,000, about 30,000. Right, so I have about a quarter of the number of parameters, but my accuracy has gone up from 47% to 60%. Right, and the time per epoch here is under 30 seconds, and here also. So the time per epoch is about the same, and that's not surprising because when you use small, simple architectures, most of the time is the memory transfer. Uh, the actual time doing the compute is is trivial. Okay. So I'm going to refactor this slightly um, because I want to try and put less stuff inside my forward, and so calling ReLU every time you know doesn't seem ideal. So I'm going to create a new class called ConvLayer. Okay, and the ConvLayer class is going to contain a convolution with a kernel size of three and a stride of two. One thing I'm going to do now is I'm going to add padding. Did you notice here the first layer went from 32 by 32? To 15 by 15, not 16 by 16. And the reason for that is that at the very edge of your convolution, right here, see how this first convolution, like there isn't a convolution where the middle is the top left point, right? Because there's like nothing outside it. Where else, if we had put um, a row of zeros at the top and a row of zeros at the edge of each column, we now could go all the way to the edge, right? So pad equals one adds that little layer of zeros around the edge for us, okay? And so this way we're going to make sure that we go 32 by 32 to 16 by 16 to 8 by 8. It doesn't matter too much when you've got these bigger layers, but by the time you get down to like, say, 4 by 4, you really don't want to throw away a whole piece. Right? So the padding becomes important. So by refactoring it to put uh, this with its defaults here, and then in the forward I'll put the ReLU in here as well, it makes my ConvNet you know, a little bit smaller, and you know, more to the point, it's going to be easier for me to make sure that everything's correct in the future by always using this ConvLayer class. Okay? So now you know not only how to create your own neural network model, but how to create your own neural network layer. So here now I can use ConvLayer, right? And this is such a cool thing about PyTorch, is a layer definition and a neural network definition are literally identical. Okay, they both have a constructor and a forward. And so anytime you've got a layer, you can use it as a neural net. Anytime you have a neural net, you can use it as a layer. Okay, so this is now the exact same thing as we had before. Um, one difference is I now have padding. Okay. And another thing, just to show you, you can do things differently. Back here, my max pool I did as as an object, like I used the class nn .adaptive max pool, and I stuck it in this attribute, and then I called it. But this actually doesn't have any state. There's no weights inside max pooling. 
So I can actually do it with a little bit less code by calling it as a function Right so everything that you can do as a class you can also do as a function. It's inside this capital F which is nn dot functional okay? um, So this should be a tiny bit better um, because um, uh, this time I've got uh, the padding um, I didn't train it for as long to actually check so Let's skip over that all right um, So one issue here is that in the end um, This is having um, I, when I tried to add more layers um, I, I had trouble training it okay, and um, The reason I was having trouble training it is it was you know if I used larger learning rates It would go off to NAN and if I use smaller learning rates that it kind of takes forever and doesn't really have a chance to explore properly Um, so it wasn't resilient So to make my model more resilient, I'm going to use something called batch normalization Which like literally everybody calls batch norm and batch norm is I guess it's a couple of years old now um, And it's been pretty transformative since it came along because it suddenly makes it really easy to train deeper networks All right, so the network I'm going to create Is going to have more layers, right? I've got one two three four five convolutional layers plus a fully connected layer, right? So like back in the old days that would be considered a pretty deep network and we've considered pretty hard to train Nowadays, it's super simple. Thanks to batch norm Now um, to use batch norm you can just write nn dot batch norm, but to learn about it We're going to write it from scratch. Okay, so the basic idea of batch norm Is that we've got some Vector of activations anytime I draw a vector of activations obviously I mean you can repeat it for the mini batch so like pretend it's a mini batch of one so we've got some vector of activations Okay, and it's coming into some layer Right, so it's probably some convolution or matrix multiplication and then something comes out the other side um, So imagine this this is just a matrix multiply which was like I don't know say it was a Identity matrix Right then every time I multiply it by that across lots and lots of layers my activations are not getting bigger. They're not getting smaller They're not changing at all Right, um, that's all fine, right, but imagine if it was actually like two 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 Right and so if every one of my weight matrices or filters was like that then my activations are doubling each time Right, and so suddenly I've got this exponential growth and that in deep models That's going to be a disaster right because my gradients are exploding at an exponential rate and so the challenge you have is that it's it's very Unlikely unless you try carefully to deal with it that your matrices your weight matrices on average are not going to cause your Um, activations to keep getting smaller and smaller or keep getting bigger and bigger right you have to kind of carefully control things to make sure that they stay You know at a reasonable size you want to you know keep them At a reasonable scale so we start things off with zero mean standard deviation one by normalizing the inputs But what we'd really like to do is to normalize every layer not just the inputs okay And so Okay, fine. Let's do that Right, so here I've created a BN layer, which is exactly like my conv layer It's got my conv 2d with my stride my padding, right? I do my con for my ReLU Right, and then I calculate the mean of each channel or of each filter and the standard deviation of each channel or each filter and then I subtract The means and divide by the standard deviations, right? So Now I don't actually need to normalize my input at all because it's actually going to do it automatically, right? It's normalizing it per channel um, or, And for later layers, it's normalizing it per filter So it turns out that's not enough right because SGD is bloody minded Right, and so if SGD decided that it wants the weight matrix to be, you know, like so, where that matrix is something which is going to, you know, increase the values uh, overall repeatedly, 
then trying to divide it by the subtract the means and divide by the standard deviations just means the next mini batch is going to try and do it again and it'll try and do it again and it'll try and do it again so it turns out that this actually doesn't help like it literally does nothing because SGD is just going to go ahead and and undo it the next mini batch so what we do is we create a new multiplier for each channel and a new um, added value for each channel like literally just and we just start them out as the addition the addition is just a bunch of zeros so for the first layer three zeros uh, and the multiplier for the first layer is just three ones okay so number of filters for the first layer is just three and so we then like basically undo exactly what we just did or potentially we undo them right so by saying this is an nn dot parameter that tells PyTorch you're allowed to learn these as weights right so initially it says okay subtract the means divide by the standard deviations multiply by one add on zero okay that's fine nothing much happened there but what it turns out is that now rather than like if it wants to kind of scale the layer up it doesn't have to scale up every single value in the matrix it can just scale up this single trio of numbers self dot M if it wants to shift it all up or down a bit it doesn't have to shift the entire weight matrix it can just shift this trio of numbers self dot a so I will say this um, at this talk I mentioned at NIPS Ali Rahimi's talk about rigor he actually pointed to this paper this batch norm paper as being a particularly useful particularly interesting paper where a lot of people don't necessarily we quite quite know why it works right and so if you're thinking like okay subtracting out the means and then adding some learned weights of exactly the same um, rank and size sounds like a weird thing to do there are a lot of people that feel the same way right so I, I, at the moment I think the best is I can say like intuitively is what's going on here is that we're normalizing the data and then we're saying you can then shift it and scale it using far fewer parameters than would have been necessary if I was asking you to actually shift and scale the entire set of convolutional filters right that's the kind of basic intuition more importantly in practice um, what this does um, is it adds um, is it basically allows us to increase our learning rates and it increases the resilience of training and allows us to add more layers so once I added um, a BN layer rather than a conv layer uh, I found I was able to add more layers to my model and it's still trained effectively Jeremy are we worried about anything that maybe we are divided by something very small or um, anything like that once we do this like yeah division? probably I, I think in the PyTorch version it would probably uh, be divided by self dot studs plus epsilon or something yeah um, it, this worked fine for me Uh, but yeah, that that is, that is definitely something to think about if you were trying to make this more reliable. I mentioned. Oh, sorry. So um, the self dot m and self dot a. I'm guessing it's getting updated through back propagation as well. Yeah. So by putting by saying it's an nn dot parameter, that's how we flag to PyTorch to learn it through back prop. Exactly right. The other interesting thing it turns out the batch norm does is it regularizes um, so In other words, you can often decrease or remove dropout or decrease or remove weight decay when you use batch norm <clears throat> and the reason why Is if you think about it each Mini batch is going to have a different mean and a different standard deviation to the previous mini batch so these things keep changing And because they keep changing, it's kind of changing the meaning of the filters in this subtle way. 
And so it's adding a regularization effect because it's noise. Right? And when you add noise of any kind, it regularizes your model. Right? <clears throat> I'm actually cheating a little bit here. Um, in the real version of batch norm, you don't just use uh, this batch's mean and standard deviation, but instead you take an exponentially weighted moving average um, uh, standard deviation and, and, and mean. And so if you wanted an exercise to try during the week, that would be a good thing to try. <clears throat> but I will point out something very important here, which is if self.training. When we are um, doing our training loop, this will be true when it's being applied to the training set, and it will be false when it's being applied to the validation set. And this is really important, because when you're going through the validation set, you do not want to be changing the meaning of the model. Okay? Um, so this is this really important idea, is that there are some types of layer that are actually sensitive to what the mode of the um, um, of the network is, whether it's in training mode, or as PyTorch calls it, evaluation mode, or we might say test mode. Right? And actually, we actually had a bug a couple of weeks ago when we did our mini net for movie lens, the collaborative filtering. We actually had f dot dropout in our forward pass without protecting it with a if self dot training f dot dropout. As a result of which, we were actually doing dropout in the validation piece as well as the training piece, which obviously isn't what you want, right? So I've actually gone back and fixed this by changing it to using nn dot dropout. And nn dot dropout has already been written for us to check whether it's being used in training mode or not. Right? Or alternatively, I could have added a if self dot training before I use the dropout here. Okay. So it's important to think about that. You know, any uh, and the main the main two or pretty much the only two built into um, PyTorch where this happens is dropout and batch norm. And so interestingly. Um, this is also a key difference in fast AI, which no other library does, is that um, these means and standard deviations get updated in training mode in every other library um, as soon as you basically say, I'm, I'm training, regardless even of whether that layer is set to trainable or not. And it turns out that with a pre-trained network, that's a terrible idea. If you have a pre-trained network, the specific values of those means and standard deviations in batch norm, if you change them, it changes the meaning of those pre-trained layers. Right? And so in fast AI, always by default, it won't touch those means and standard deviations if your layer is frozen. Okay? As soon as you unfreeze it, it it'll, it'll start updating them. Unless you've set um, learn.bnfreeze true. If you set learn.bn freeze true, it says never touch these means and standard deviations. And you know, I've found in practice that um, that often seems to work a lot better for pre-trained models, particularly if you're working with data that's quite similar to what the pre-trained model was trained with. Um, so I have two questions. So. Um it looks like you're doing a lot more work calculating the aggregates, you know, um, as you... Um, looks uh, like I did a lot of work, did you say? So, so Like quite so, a lot of code here? Well, you're doing more work than you would normally do. Essentially, you're calculating all these aggregates as you go through each, each, each layer. Yes. Wouldn't this mean your training, like your epoch time, like, like blows up? Like, no, this is like super fast. Like if you think about what a conv has to do, a conv has to go through every three by three, you know, with a stride, and do this multiplication and then addition. Like that is a lot more work than simply calculating the per channel mean. So this is so it adds a little bit of time, but it's uh, it's less time intensive than the convolution. So so how would you basically um, position the batch norm? Would it be like right after like the convolutional layer, or would it be after the real loop? Yeah, we'll talk about that in a moment. So at the moment we have it uh, after the ReLU, and in the original batch norm paper, I believe that's where they put it. 
So there's this um, idea of something called an ablation study, and an ablation study is um, something where you basically try kind of turning on and off um, different pieces of your model to see like which bits make which impacts. And one of the things that wasn't done in the original batch norm paper was any kind of really effective ablation study. And one of the things therefore that was missing was this question which you just asked, which is like where do you put the batch norm? Before the ReLU, after the ReLU, whatever. And so since that time, you know, that oversight has caused a lot of problems because it turned out the original paper didn't actually put it in the best spot. Um, and so then other people since then have now figured that out, and now like every time I show people code where it's actually in the spot that turns out to be better, people always say, your batch norm's in the wrong spot, and I have to go back and say, no, I know that's what the paper said, but it turned out that's not actually the right spot, and so it's kind of causes confusion. Um, so there's, there's been a lot of uh, question about that. So a little bit of a higher level question. So we started out with Cypher data. Yes. Uh, so is, is, the, is the basic reasoning that you use a smaller data set to quickly train a new model mm -hmm. and then you take it the same model and you're using uh, much, much, a much bigger data set to get a higher accuracy level. Is that the basic? Um, maybe. So if you want to, you know, if you had a large data set or if you were like interested in the question of like how good is this technique on a large data set, then yes, what you just said would be what I would do. I would do lots of testing on a small data set which I had already discovered had the same kinds of properties as my larger data set and therefore my conclusions would likely carry forward and then I would test them at the end. Having said that, Um, personally, I'm actually more interested in um, actually studying small data sets for their own sake because I find most people I speak to in the real world don't have a million images. They have, you know, somewhere between about 2,000 and 20,000 images seems to be much more common. Um, so I'm, I'm very, you know, very interested in having fewer rows because I think it's more valuable in practice. Um, I'm also pretty interested in small images, um, not just for the reason you mentioned, which is it allows me to test things out more quickly, but also, as I mentioned before, often a small part of an image actually turns out to be what you're interested in. That's certainly true in, in medicine. I have two questions. Um, the first is on um, what you mentioned in terms of small data sets, um, particularly med medical imaging, if you've heard of, a, I guess, is it Vicarious, the startup, and mm -hmm. the specialization in one-shot learning? So your opinions on that. And then the second being, um, this is related to, I guess, uh, Ali's uh, talk at NIP. So mm -hmm. it was, I don't want to say it's controversial, but like um, Jan LeCun, there was like a really, I guess, controversial thread mm -hmm. attacking it in terms of what you're Uh, talking about as a baseline of um, theory, just not keeping up with practice. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, I guess I was siding with Jan, whereas Ollie actually, he tweeted at me quite a bit, trying to defend like he wasn't a a attacking Jan at all, but right. in fact, uh, he was, you know, trying to support him, but I just kind of feel like a lot of theory as, as you go is um, just sort of out of date and it's hard to keep up other than, you know, an yeah. archive from Andre Kaparthi to keep up, but I mean, <laughs> if the theory isn't keeping up, but the industry is the one that's actually setting the standard, then doesn't that mean that, you know, people who are actual practitioners are the ones like Jan Lacuna are publishing the theory that are yeah. keeping up to date, whereas like academic research institutions are actually behind? So I don't have any comments on the vicarious papers because I haven't read them. I'm, I'm not aware of any of them as, as actually showing you know, better results than other papers, but I think they've come a long way in the last 12 months, so that might be wrong. Um, yeah, the, I think the discussion between Jan Lekun and Ali Rahimi is very interesting because they're both smart people who have interesting things to say. Unfortunately, a lot of people took Ali's talk as meaning something which he says it didn't mean, and when I listen to his talk, I'm not sure he didn't actually mean it at the time, but he clearly doesn't mean it now, which is He's, he's now said many times he didn't he was not talking about theory. He was not saying we need more theory at all um, Actually, he thinks we need more experiments and so specifically 
He's, he's also now saying he wished he hadn't used the word rigor, which I also wish, because rigor is it's kind of meaningless, and everybody can kind of say, when he says rigor, he means the specific thing I study. You know, um, um, so lots of people have kind of taken his talk as being like, oh yes, this proves that nobody else should work in neural networks unless they are experts at the one thing I'm an expert in. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to catch up with him and talk about more about this in January, and hopefully we'll figure some more stuff out together. But basically, what we we can clearly agree on, and I think Jan LeCun also agrees on, is um, Careful experiments are important uh, Just doing things on massive amounts of data using massive amounts of TPUs or GPUs is not interesting of itself and we should instead try to Design experiments that give us the maximum amount of insight into what's going on So, so Jeremy is it um, a good statement to say something like um, so a, a dropout and um, Bash norm are very different things. Um, dropout is a regularization technique, and bash norm has maybe some regularization effect, but it's actually just about convergence of the optimization method. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and I would further say like, I can't see any reason not to use bash norm. There are versions of bash norm that in certain situations turned out not to work so well. But people have figured out ways around that for nearly every one of those situations now So I would always seek to find a way to use batch norm It may be a little harder in RNNs mm. at least um, But even there there are ways of doing batch norm in RNNs as well yeah. So you know try try and always use batch norm on every layer if you can and um, the question that somebody asked is um, Does it mean I have to s I can stop? Um, normalizing my data. Yeah, yeah, it it, it does. Um, although, do it anyway because it's not at all hard to do it, and at least that way the people using your data, I don't know, they kind of know how you've normalized it, um, and particularly with these issues around a lot of libraries. In my opinion at least well, not my opinion my experiments Don't deal with batch norm correctly for pre-trained models. Just remember that when somebody starts retraining Those averages and stuff are going to change for your data set And so if your new data set has very different input averages, it could really cause a lot of problems. So um, So yeah, I went through a period where I actually stopped normalizing my data and you know things kind of worked, but it's probably not worth it Okay So um, So the rest of this is identical Right all I've done is I've changed Conf layer to BN layer um, But I've done one more thing which is I'm kind of trying to try to get closer and closer to modern approaches Which I've added a single convolutional layer at the start uh, With a bigger kernel size and a stride of one now Why have I done that? So the basic idea is that I want my first layer to kind of have a richer input, right? So before my first layer had an input of just three because there's just three channels, right? But if I start with my image, right? And And I kind of take a bigger area oh, Let's pick a different color. I kind of take a bigger area Right, and I do a convolution using that bigger area. In this case, I'm doing um, five by five, right? Then that kind of allows me to try and find more interesting, richer features in that five by five area. And so then I spit out a bigger output. In this case, I spit out a filter size. Uh, I spit out ten five by five filters. And so. The idea is like pretty much every state-of-the-art convolutional architecture now starts out with a single conf layer with like a 5x5 or 7x7 or sometimes even like 11x11 um, convolution with like quite a few filters. You know, something like 
you know, 32 filters coming out. And it's just, just, it's just a way of kind of trying to, and like, because I used a stride of 1 and a padding of kernel size minus 1 over 2, it means that my output is going to be exactly the same size as my input, but just got more filters. Right, so this is just a good way of trying to create a richer starting point for my sequence of convolutional layers. Okay, so that's the basic theory um, of why I've added this single convolution, which I just do once at the start, and then I just go through all my layers, and then I do my adaptive max pooling and my final classifier layer. Okay, so it's a minor tweak, but it helps, right? And so you'll see now I kind of can go from where did I have? 60% and after a couple it was 45% Now after a couple it's 57% and after a few more I'm up to 68% Okay, so you can see it's you know the, the batch norm and you know tiny bit the conv layer at the start It's helping and what's more you can see this is still increasing Right, so that's looking pretty encouraging Okay, so given that this is looking pretty good an obvious thing to try might be to um, let's see uh, is to try increasing the depth of the model and now I can't just add more of my stride two layers because um, remember how it halved the size of the image each time um, I'm basically down to two by two at the end right so I can't add much more so what I did instead was I said okay here's my original layers these are my stride two layers for every one also create a stride one layer so a stride one layer doesn't change the size and so now I'm saying zip my stride two layers and my stride one layers together and so first of all do the stride two and then do the stride one so this is now actually twice as deep okay so this is so this is now twice as deep um, but I end up with the exact same, you know, two by two that I had before. And so if I try this, you know, here after one, two, three, four epochs is at 65 percent. After one, two, three epochs, I'm still at 65 percent. It hasn't helped, right? And so <clears throat> the reason it hasn't helped is I'm now too deep, even for batch norm to handle it. So my depth is now. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 times 2 is t uh, 10, 11, conv 1, 12. Okay, so 12 layers deep, it's possible to train a standard conv net 12 layers deep, but it starts to get difficult to do it properly, right? And it certainly doesn't seem to be really helping much, if at all. So that's where I'm instead going to replace uh, this with a ResNet. Alright, so a ResNet is our final stage. And what a ResNet does is I'm going to replace our BN layer, right? I'm going to inherit from BN layer and replace our forward with that. And that's it. Everything else is going to be identical, um, except now I'm going to do like way lots of layers. I'm going to make it four times deeper, right? And it's going to train beautifully just because of that. So why does that help so much? So this is called a ResNet block, and as you can see, I'm saying that's not what I meant to do. I'm saying my predictions equals my input plus some function, you know, in this case a convolution of my input. Right? That's 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 what I've written here, and so I'm now going to shuffle that around a little bit. And I'm going to say I'm going to say uh, f of x equals y minus x. Okay, so that's the same thing, shuffled around, right? That's my prediction from the previous layer, right? And so what this is then doing is it's trying to fit a function to the difference between these two. Right? And so the difference is actually the residual So 
if this is what I'm trying to calculate, my actual y value, and this is the thing that I've most recently calculated, then the difference between the two is basically the error in terms of what I've calculated so far. And so this is therefore saying that, okay, try to find a set of convolutional weights that attempts to fill in the, the amount I was off by. Right? So in other words, if we... let's clear this out. If we have some inputs coming in, right, and then we have this function which is basically trying to predict the error, it's like how much are we off by, right, and then we add that on, so we basically add on this additional like prediction of how much were we wrong by, and then we add on another prediction of how much were we, were we wrong by that time, and add on another prediction of how much were we wrong by that time, then, then each time we're kind of zooming in, getting closer and closer to our correct answer. And each time we're saying like, okay, we've got to a certain point, but we've still got an error, we've still got a residual, so let's try and create a model that just predicts that residual, and add that onto our previous model. And then let's build another model that predicts the residual, and add that onto our previous model. And if we keep doing that again and again, we should get closer and closer to our answer. And this is based on a theory called boosting, which people that have done some machine learning will have certainly come across, right? And so basically the trick here is that by specifying that as being the thing that we're trying to calculate, then we kind of get boosting for free. Right? It's like because we can just juggle that around to show that actually it's just calculating a model on the residual. So that's kind of amazing. Um, and you know, it totally works. As you can see here, I've now got my standard batch norm layer, okay, which is something which is going to reduce my size by two because it's got the stride two. And then I've got a ResNet layer of stride one. And another ResNet layer of stride one, right? And sorry, I think I said that was four of these. It's actually three of these. So this is now three times deeper. I zip through all of those, and so I've now got a function of a function of a function. So three layers per group, and then my conv at the start and my linear at the end. Right? So this is now three times bigger than my original. And if I fit it. You can see it just keeps going up and up and up and up. I keep fitting it more. It keeps going up and up and up and up and up. And it's still going up when I kind of got bored. Okay. So the ResNet has been um, a really important development, um, and it's allowed us to create these really deep networks. Right now, the full ResNet does not quite look the way I've described it here. Uh, the full ResNet doesn't just have one convolution, right? but it actually has two convolutions. right? So the way people normally draw ResNet blocks is they normally say, you've got some input coming into the layer, it goes through one convolution, two convolutions, and then gets added back to the original input. Right? That's the full version of, of, of a ResNet block. In my case, I've just done one convolution. Okay. And then you'll see also, in every block, right, one of them, it's actually the first one, see Daisy. It's actually the first one here is not a ResNet block, but a standard convolution with a stride of two. Right? This is called a bottleneck layer, right? and the idea is this is not a ResNet block. So from time to time, we actually change the geometry, right? we're doing the stride 2. In uh, ResNet, we don't actually use just a standard convolutional layer. Uh, there's actually a different form of bottleneck block that I'm not going to teach you in this course, I'm going to teach you in part 2. Okay? But as you can see, even this somewhat simplified version of a ResNet still works pretty well. And so we can make it a little bit bigger, right? And so here I've just 
increased all of my sizes uh, I have still got my three and also I've added dropout Right. So at this point, I'm going to say this is other than the minor simplification of ResNet You know a reasonable approximation of a good starting point for a modern architecture Okay, and so now I've added in my point to dropout. I've increased the size here, and if I train this You know I can train it for a while. It's going pretty well. I can then add in TTA at the end eventually I get 85% and you know this is at a point now where Like literally I wrote this whole notebook in like three hours, right? We can like create this thing in three hours and This is like an accuracy that in kind of 2012-2013 was considered Pretty much state-of-the-art for sci-fi tech, right? So this is actually Yeah, this is actually pretty damn good um, To get you know nowadays uh, the most recent results are like 97% You know there are there's plenty of room we can still improve, but they're all based on these techniques like there isn't really anything You know when we start looking in at, 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 in part two at like how to get this right up to state-of-the-art You'll see it's basically better approaches to data augmentation uh, better approaches to regularization uh, Some tweaks on ResNet, but it's, it's all basically this idea Okay, so uh, yes So is the residual uh, training on the residual method is that only uh, Looks like it's a generic uh, thing that can be applied non image problems. Oh great question. Time. Yeah. Yes, it is But it's like been ignored everywhere else um, in NLP something called the transformer architecture recently appeared and um, You know was shown to be the state-of-the-art for translation and it's got like a simple ResNet structure in it first time I've ever seen it in NLP. Uh, I haven't really seen anybody else take advantage of it um, Yeah, this general approach we call these skip connections this idea of like skipping over a layer and kind of doing an identity It's yeah, it's been appearing a lot in computer vision and nobody else much seems to be using it Even though there's nothing computer vision specific about it. So I think it's a big opportunity Okay So final stage I want to show you um, Is how to use an extra feature of PyTorch um, To do something cool and it's going to be a kind of a segue into part two. It's going to be our first little Hint as to what else we can build on on these neural nets and so and it's also going to take us all the way back to lesson one uh, Which is we're going to do dogs and cats. Okay, so going all the way back to dogs and cats We're going to create a ResNet 34. Okay, so these different ResNet 34, 50, 101, they're they're basically just different numbers or different size blocks. It's like how many of these kind of pieces do you have before each bottleneck block, and then how many of these sets of super blocks do you have, right? That's all these different numbers mean. So if you look at the um, Torch vision source code you can actually see the definition of these different resnets. You'll see they're all just different parameters, right? Um, okay, so we're going to use resnet 34 and so we're going to do this a little bit more by hand Okay, so if this is my architecture, this is just the name of a function Then I can call it to get that model right and then true um, if we look at the definition Is do I want the pre-trained? So in other words, is it going to load in the pre-trained image net weights? Okay, so M now contains a model and so I can take a look at it like so Okay, and so you can see here what's going on right is that um, Inside here. I've got my initial 2d convolution and here is that kernel size of 7 by 7 Okay, and interestingly in this case it actually starts out with a 7x7 stride 2 Okay, there's the padding that we talked about to make sure that we don't lose the edges, right? There's our batch norm Okay, there's our ReLU And you get the idea right con and then so here you can now see There's a layer that contains a bunch of blocks Right, so here's a block which contains a conv batch norm ReLU conv batch norm you can't see it printed But after this is where it does the addition, right? So there's like a whole ResNet block and then another ResNet block and then another ResNet block, okay? Um, and then you can see also Sometimes 
you see one where there's a stride 2. Right? So here's actually one of these bottleneck layers. Okay? Um, so you can kind of see how this is, this is structured. Um, so in our case, um, sorry I skipped over this a little bit, but the approach that we ended up using for ReLU was to put it um, before our let's have a look before our batch norm which let's see what they do here we've got batch norm ReLU conv batch norm ReLU conv okay so you can see the order that they're using it here okay um, and you'll find like there's two different versions of ResNet In fact, there's three different versions of ResNet floating around. Um, the one which actually turns out to be the best is called the Preact ResNet, which has a different ordering again. Um, um, uh, but you can look it up. Uh, it's basically a different order of where the ReLU and where the batch norm sit. Okay, so we're going to start with a standard ResNet 34. And normally, Um, what we do is we need to now turn this into something that can predict dogs versus cats, right? So currently the final layer has a thousand features because ImageNet has a thousand features, right? So we need to get rid of this. So when you use uh, conf learner from pre-trained in fast AI, it actually deletes this layer for you um, and it also deletes this layer. And something that as far as I know is unique to fast AI is we replace this see this average pooling layer of size 7 by 7 right so this is the basically the adaptive pooling layer but whoever wrote this didn't know about adaptive pooling so they manually said oh I know it's meant to be 7 by 7 right so in fast AI we replace this with adaptive pooling but we actually do both adaptive average pooling and adaptive max pooling and we then concatenate the two together um, which It's it is something we invented, but uh, at the same time we invented it somebody wrote a paper about it So it's you know, we don't get any credit um, But I think we're the only library that provides it and certainly the only one that does it by default um, We're going to for the purpose of this exercise though We're going to do a simple version where we delete the last two layers. So we'll grab all the children of the model We'll delete the last two layers and then instead we're going to add a convolution Which just has two outputs Right, I'll show you why in a moment, right? Uh, then we're going to do our average pooling and then we're going to do our softmax Okay, so that's a model which is going to have um, You'll see that there is no this one has a fully connected layer at the end This one does not have a fully connected layer at the end But if you think about it this convolutional layer is going to be Two filters only Right, and it's going to be two by seven by seven and so once we then do the average pooling It's going to end up being just two numbers that it produces. So this is a different way of producing just two numbers I'm not going to say it's better. I'm just going to say it's different, right? But there's a reason we do it. I'll show you the reason we can now train this model in the usual way, right? So we can say transforms model image classifier data from paths And then we can use that conf learner from model data. We just learned about I'm now going to freeze every single layer except for That one and this is the fourth last layer so we'll say freeze to minus four Right and so this is just training the last layer Okay, so we get 99.1% accuracy so that you know this approach is working fine um, And here's what we can do though. We can now do something called um Uh, what was it? Class CAM, class activated maps, class activation maps. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to try to look at this particular cat, and we're going to use a technique called class activation maps, where we take our model and we ask it which parts of this image turned out to be important. And when we do this, it's going to feed out. This is the picture it's going to create, right? And so as you can see here, it's found. The cat. So how did it do that? Well, the way it did that, we'll kind of work backwards, is to produce this matrix. 
Right? You'll see in this matrix there's some pretty big numbers around about here, which correspond to our cat. So what is this matrix? This matrix is simply equal to the value of this feature matrix times this py vector. The py vector is simply equal to the predictions, which in this case said I'm 100% confident it's a cat. Right? So this is just equal to the value of, if I just call the model, passing in our cat, this is our cat, right? it's an x, then we get our predictions. Right? So that's just the value of our predictions. So py is just the value of our predictions. What about feet? What's that equal to? Feet is equal to the values in this layer. Right? In other words, the value that comes out of the final, in fact, it's coming out of this layer, coming out of the final convolutional layer. Right? So it's actually the 7 by 7 by 2. Right? And so you can see here, let's see, feet. The shape of features is 2 filters by 7 by 7. Right? So the idea is, if we multiply that vector by that tensor, Right? Then it's going to end up grabbing all of the first channel, because that's a 1, and none of the second channel, because that's a 0. And so therefore it's going to return the value of the last convolutional layer for the, for the section which lines up with being a cat. Right? If you think about it, this, the first section lines up with being a cat, the second section lines up with being a dog. So if we multiply that tensor by that tensor, we end up with this matrix. And this matrix is which parts are most like a cat. Or to put it another way, in our model, the only thing that happened after the convolutional layer was an average pooling layer. So the average pooling layer took that 7x7 seven seven grid and said, average out how much each part is cat-like. Right? And so my final value, my final prediction was the average cattiness of the whole thing. Right? And so because it had to be able to average out these things to get the average cattiness, that means I could then just take this matrix and resize it to be the same size as my original cat and just overlay it on top to get this heat map. Right? So the way you can use this technique at home is to basically calculate this matrix right on some like really if you've got some really big picture you can calculate this matrix on a quick small little convnet and then zoom into the bit that has the highest value and then rerun it just on that part right so it's like oh this is the area that seems to be the most like a cat or most like a dog that zoom in to that bit right so i skipped over that pretty quickly because we ran out of time um, and so we'll be learning more about these kind of approaches in part two, and we can talk about it more on the forum, but hopefully you get the idea. The one thing I totally skipped over was how do we actually ask for that particular layer, okay? And I'll let you read about this during the week, but basically there's a thing called um, a hook. So we said, um, we called save features, which is this little class that we wrote that goes register forward hook, and basically a forward hook is a special PyTorch thing that every time it calculates a layer, it runs this function. It's like a callback, basically. It's like a callback that happens every time it calculates a layer. And so in this case, it just saved the value of the particular layer that I was interested in. Okay, And so that way I was able to go inside here and grab those features out uh, let's have a look um, After I was done Okay, so I call save features uh, That gives me my hook and then later on I can just grab the value that I saved Okay, so I skipped over that pretty quickly But if you look in the PyTorch docs, they have some more information and help about that uh, Yes, Yannette, do you have the... Jeremy, can you spend um, five minutes uh, talking about your journey into deep learning? Um, 
Yeah, and finally, how can we keep up with um, important research that is important to practitioners? Yeah, so I was going to, I was going to, I think I'll close more on the latter bit, which is like what now? Okay, so um, for those of you who are interested, you should aim to come back for part two. If you're aiming to come back for part two, how many people would like to come back for part two? Okay, that's not bad. I think almost everybody. Um, so if you want to come back for part two, be aware of this. Um, by that time, you're expected to have mastered all of the techniques we've learned in part one. Okay, and there's plenty of time between now and then, Okay, even if you haven't done much or any ML before, but it does assume that you're going to be working you know, at the same level of intensity from now until then that you have been with practicing, right? So practicing, so generally speaking, the people who did well in part two last year had watched each of the videos about three times, right? And some of the people actually I knew had, had actually discovered they learned some of them off by heart by mistake. So the, like watching the videos again is helpful. And make sure you get to the point that you can recreate the notebooks without watching the videos, right? And so they then make it more interesting, obviously, try and recreate the notebooks using different data sets. Uh, you know, and definitely then just keep up with the forum and you'll see people keep on posting more stuff about recent papers and recent advances, and uh, over the next couple of months you'll find increasingly less and less of it seems weird and mysterious, and more and more of it makes perfect sense. Um, and so it's a bit of a case of just staying, staying tenacious. You know, there's always going to be stuff that you don't understand yet, and but you'll be surprised if you go back to lesson one and two now, you'll be like, oh, that's all trivial, right? Um, so you know, that's kind of hopefully a bit of your learning journey, um, and yeah, I think the main thing I've noticed is that people who succeed are the ones who just keep keep working at it. You know, so not coming back here every Monday, you're not going to have that forcing function. Like I've noticed the forum suddenly gets busy at 5 p.m. on a Monday, you know It's like oh course is about to start and suddenly these questions start coming in So now that you don't have that forcing function, you know try and use some other technique to You know give yourself that little kick. Maybe you can tell your partner at home You know I'm gonna try and produce something every Saturday for the next four weeks or I'm gonna try and finish reading this paper or or something you know um, Anyway, so I hope to see you all back uh, in um, March, and uh, even uh, regardless whether I do or don't, it's been a really great pleasure to get to know you all, and I uh, hope to keep seeing you on the forum. Thanks very much.